Um, uh, indicate yesterday with these two concepts of the gentilhomme for the, let's say, Louis XIV period that changes into the galantum for the Regence period. So far, my summary. Are there any questions about anything that I've just said? Okay, well, it's crystal clear. <laughs> very well informed about that, that's one thing, uh, but also we, the information that we have is that um, the ones who were responsible for the, for the mu in, in music business, so the printers or, uh, as well as the court composers, had royal privileges and um, through which it was forbidden for anybody else to do something official. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, но известно то, что э, те люди, которые занимались музыкой, композиторы, равно как и э, печатники, которые печатали ноты, и обладали королевскими привилегиями. А кроме э, определенно отмеченных людей, всем остальным было просто запрещено этим заниматься. А вот это уже решено. You know, first of all, I would like to I would answer that in, in two different ways. Um, all what we've been saying up till now um, pertains for what we now call classical music. So also in Italy, we didn't tackle any of the real folk and um, um, rural traditions. What we know, however, is that in Italy, because it was much more musical for people, that folk elements really um, made their way in what we now call classical music, whereas in France they were suppressed. And this is the same in all other parts of culture. We see, for example, I would say that at the end of this day, um, as we look at cuisine, for example, you see that uh, the 17th century for Italy is a moment that the cuisine becomes what it more or less is now, with many regional differences and influences, whereas in France it, there are only a very limited um, amount of dishes that actually make it to the grande cuisine, escargots, for example, being one of the exceptions. То же самое касается и других, тоже можно сказать, о других культурных сферах. Допустим, если взять национальную кухню, то в Италии как раз в 17 веке региональные блюда становятся частью итальянской кухни, как мы ее знаем сегодня. Во Франции, напротив, очень мало региональных простых христианских блюд попадают в так называемую высокую кухню. Well, uh, what we can 
can say is that in the Provence, and so uh, the, the, the most remote part of France from, from the, the capital, that it, um, um, notwithstanding several attempts of the French kings in history to destroy the culture of Occitania, of that region, there was a local culture going on. It just does not play a role in history, in, in the history of arts as it is. But there was something going on. Nobody is and was interested. In, this, in, in the cities, the big cities, Lyon and Paris, we know that there were professional guilds still active, uh, producing trained musicians, uh, fiddlers, uh, violin players, but they were all used in the machinery of this court music. That means that there was, of course, a broad basis. There were many noble houses that had their social evenings with music, and this was all part of the pyramid which summit was the court. И, конечно, в Леоне и в Париже существовали гильдии музыкантов, которые э, давали представления, были скрипачи, э, флейтисты, но все они входили составными частями в эту большую музыкальную машину, о которой мы говорили. И, конечно, существовало для, для того, чтобы эту пирамиду построить, необходимо было широкое основание. Во многих э, благородных домах э, давали домашние концерты, были свои музыканты, но все это входило in French Baroque culture, at least during Louis XIV, there's simply no place for um, local traditions because the, the general image is, is if it's not related to the king, if it's not related to the aesthetics of the king, somehow it's not it's worth nothing. Uh, So, no. Well, yeah, there were different attempts. I mean, what I, what I told you is that during the different uh, periods of monarchy, there were periods in which the, 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 the bourgeoisie played a more important role. But, and these would also probably be the moments that folkloristic traditions popped up a little bit, but this is not enough basis to really create. Uh, France is not a state model that uses its diversity, uses its uh, the typical things that it has as a sort of image of itself. It will not make propaganda with the bouillabaisse and ratatouille. It will make propaganda, propaganda with the grand cuisine, you know. Italy is in the country, it will show you, Italy will say, we have Venice, we have Naples, we have Sicily, and this is all Italy. And you can eat pizza there, and you can eat vongole there, and you can, you know. This is a different concept of how you um, uh, how you um, uh, announce and, and sort of carry out the image of your state? Конечно, были моменты во Франции, в барочные периоды, когда, скажем, буржуазия играла несколько более важную роль в жизни государства. Тогда мы эти моменты несколько поднимали голову, так сказать, национальные местные традиции, но все же это недостаточно для того, чтобы о них сейчас говорить. Важно отметить, что Франция э, сам, э, тот образ, который Франция создавала, э, там, образ себя самой как страны, который экспортировался, французская пропаганда, не была основана на, э, на разнообразии. Э, образ французской державы не, э, не включал в себя местные, э, местные обычные традиции не рекламировались местные блюда, скажем, Марсель, Марселе или, или Лион, Франция была представлена хамфюзин, высокой кухни, между тем, как в Италии положение обратное, Италия себя представляла как страну разнообразную, у нас есть Неаполь, у нас есть Венеция, у нас есть Сисилия, все это Италия, у нас типа, есть пиццу здесь, спагетти там, все, мы разнообразны, но все это мы 
Франция всегда устроена, Франция себя видела как единую державу, централизованную в плане Шарина. Um, what consists, what, 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 um, what France really is, is an idea, whereas what Italy really is, is a reality. Yeah. France always is a, um, uh, in France, metaphor is incredibly important. Во Франции uh, огромным значением обладает uh, метафора. Uh, in music also, almost yeah, everything is a metaphor or something else. Практически все представляет из себя метафору чего-то. Whereas in Italy, it's to be a thing. What you see is what you get. А в Италии то, что вы видите, это то, что вы видите. Yeah? Now, after this, again, historical and theoretical bit today, I would like to move on now, again, to something more practical and something closer to our pra practice as musicians. And I, I would like to introduce also this new part and um, conclude the first one before we take a break um, by asking you, do you have any idea at all what might be the other reason or reasons that might be responsible for the differences in style on our list that we still have that are not yet explained? Есть ли у вас какие-либо соображения, какие-либо объяснения для тех э, э, разниц, для тех различий, которые еще остались необъясненными с прошлого, с, с вчерашнего дня? Somebody has an idea? Well, mental and social. Not only social and political, uh, but national character. Uh, could you just say yeah, some well? inner, inner could you could you ask the question in Russian? Because then we stay with the same system. It's a very interesting question that I actually discussed with Olga yesterday over dinner. Um, uh, I, I don't think uh, this is something that has really interesting me enormously. I really, this is what I'm. Um, this is uh, something that really sort of. Um, uh, how do you say? That? Uh, also, coming here to Petersburg, I asked this question for myself: What what is the Russian soul, for example? <laughs> huh? Where can I find it, and on what is it based? <laughs> Как раз приезжая в Россию, задал себе вопрос, а что такое русская душа и на чем она основана. So what I, my method, my method, I think, would be because I, I really think that you're asking a very um, crucial question. But I think there is one danger if you are uh, going too quickly towards that sort of bottom. Uh, if you if you're not um, looking at each layer that you're traveling through to reach the bottom, the danger is that you will end up with racist theories. Вопрос чрезвычайно важный, но здесь существует одна опасность. Если вы слишком быстро спускаетесь к этому уровню психологическому, не рассматриваете слои, через которые вы проходите по дороге, то вы рискуете получить теорию, которая будет российской. It is very difficult for me, for example, and I'll take that example because it's 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 real for me now. It's really it's very difficult for me to understand, and we discussed this, what might be elements of Russian soul, for example, and how much of that is Russian, how much of that is still Soviet, how much I mean, how can we? What are the criteria to to make to cut out what is not essential and to leave what is essential. На примеру, для меня было очень сложно определить, какие элементы в русской душе, собственно, относятся к русской душе, какие элементы наносные советские, каким образом их разделить 
и где критерии для оценки? Uh, so, um, I would um, just postpone your question a little bit. I do not feel, first of all, that I'm personally ready to answer that in, in the case of Italy and France in the 17th century, but I also want to spend, this is the first thing, I don't want to, um, I'm not ready, I'm not feel ready. Second thing is that I feel, however, ready to yet discover other layers before we reach that bottom point. Uh, на него ответить в отношении Франции и Италии, и во-вторых, потому что хотелось бы рассмотреть другие слои, которые лежат по дороге к этому уровню. So be before we talk about poss possibilities, in my mind, would be the landscape, the, 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 um, the, the nutrition that you find in a specific um, country. Um, the kind of water and minerals that you drink and that must be responsible for the structures of your brains, for example, before we discuss any of this, which I really find so important, I would like to, um, um, I would like to spend some energy to a, a, a layer that is, that, which I know is not the bottom one. <laughs> чем он питается, какого, какого рода э, воду пьет, какие минералы содержит эта вода, которая может влиять на... На настрой, на мышление. Хотелось поговорить, поговорить о тех э, слоях, которые, я знаю, не есть э, самые нижние слои. Mm -hmm. So I hope that this is a kind of answer. I'm not going to answer it really uh, out of respect <laughs> and out of fear to say something that is actually ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> из уважения к, к, этому, к этому вопросу и из страха сказать что-либо, что, что, что будет преждевременным или so, не соответствующим действительности. Let's perhaps not look now for the Italian soul and the French soul, but let's maybe look for other elements that might be responsible for the differences that we still have on the, on the whiteboard. Now, can somebody come up with an idea? Поэтому uh, давайте пока отложим uh, вопрос о различии между итальянской и французской душой и посмотрим на те различия, которые у нас изображены на доске. take such uh, uh, diverse things as the uh, the classical theatre in in, um, in France, the Alexandrian style, or there must have been some interesting development in Italy as well. These things can't be defined uh, or determined by the state policy only, and there must be other factors. Uh, yeah, but ed education in both countries was organized by the same society that we just described. Uh, in Italy being a more, what you could call, democratic way, or at least more directed to the different layers of the people, whereas in France it is organized from above, from the court, in cooperation with a few orders, religious orders, that really implanted the, the state ideal. It's, it's a totalitarian regime. And so, yes, I think that to a large extent you could um, explain typical styles from within these two different social uh, views. I, I, I acknowledge that there is one important element missing, but that's what I'm asking you for. 
образование, на самом деле, в значительной степени и в Италии, и во Франции было организовано государством. Разница, что во Франции, в Италии оно было еще несколько более демократичным, или, по крайней мере, направленным более к различным, обращенным более к различным слоям населения. Между тем, в Франции оно было все организовано сверху в сотрудничестве с религиозными, с монашескими орденами, которые и э, с своей стороны тоже внедряли эту идею государства. Э, поэтому, да, э, большинство различий стерилевых могут быть объяснены социальными причинами, но не все. Вот Что-то один элемент, одного элемента не хватает, и как раз я вас спрашиваю о том, что же это за An important difference, for example, as I'm thinking while Olga is translating, is that in, in Italy, in many respects, things evolved as they evolved. There was not so much, of course, anything that evolved that changes has a reason why it change, changes, but sometimes you can let things happen, huh? whereas in France, everything that changed was really consciously orchestrated. They would not leave things... Um, один uh, существенный элемент uh, в, в Италии uh, вещи uh, развивались, эволюционировали несколько сами по себе. Uh, между тем, как во Франции все было очень четко uh, организовано, оркестровано, и вот, все развития находились, все развитие находилось под контролем. But let's look for one major reason, and it mustn't It should not be so difficult because we've been, um, well, dealing with that very problem also uh, since the beginning of, of this seminar. I mean, what an important factor is that could... Uh, 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 we must uh, take the musical basis into consideration yeah. because this tile is not born out of nothing. That's true. What lies at the basis of music in many, many, many uh, fields of music? I mean, it's not the only basis, but what it consists in all cultures, in fact, the basis for musical expression. I mean, uh, sorry, is they different in Renaissance style, uh, Italy and France, and they are different, so they will be different in Baroque style and etc. Well, I don't agree. First of all, in Renaissance style, they're not different. Uh, no, no. French Renaissance style is just an import of Italian, uh, even with the Queen's company. Yes, of course. It's not that скажем, стиль возрождения различается в Италии и во Франции, потому что, собственно, французское возрождение это импортированное итальянское. What, what you are right is that I think that French rock, if that exists, is a continuation to a large extent of uh, Renaissance, whereas um, in Italy there is much more of a break between Renaissance and rock. Но uh, uh, право в том, uh, что, мне кажется, французская барокко uh, есть в значительной степени продолжение французского Возрождение, между тем, как в Италии значительно, э, ну так, французское возрождение, это как бы импортированное из Италии, но так как оно прижилось во Франции. А, а в Италии э, значительно больше разрыва между порочной музыкой и музыкой возрождения. So I would even, I would go, go even as far as to say that, with the exception of the period of Mazarin in France, where we really have, again, pure Italian art imported in France, that apart from that period, that what consists, what, what, what we now call French classical art, so the period of Louis XIV, for me this is, in many respects, late Renaissance art. And it's a very daring statement. Во Франции, когда снова в чистом виде итальянское искусство импортируется во Францию, то порочное французское искусство, которое создавалось при дворе Людовика XIV, на мой взгляд, в каком-то отношении может быть названо поздним искусством возрождения. Хотя, конечно, это очень смелое заявление. For me, there is less difference between the, the, the intermediate of La Pellegrina, performed in Florence at the end of the 16th century, and 
uh, a tragédie lyrique by Lully. This is less difference for me than between a tragédie lyrique, uh, lyrique from Lully and an opera by Sartori, for example, which is composed at the same time. На мой взгляд, меньше разницы между лирической трагедией Люли и Интермедии для Перегрину, написанного в эпоху Возрождения, чем Люли и оперы Сарковио. Руша, ты хотел сказать что-то? А, извините, ты первый. Он был первый. Я хотел подумать, что, насколько я... Слышал, что в Италии церковь была очень сильной позицией имела всегда, еще со времен Средневековья, и музыкальные традиции церковные также распространялись, очевидно, они повлияли как-то на другую музыку в Италии. И поскольку... И также мы знаем, что итальян, и эта римская церковь пыталась распространиться по всей Европе, но Европа этому противилась, как Франция. Абсолютно. You're right, but I'm looking for a new thing that we haven't tackled yet. What could be a totally new element? But first, Russia. I думаю, что таким объективным фактором, который повлиял на разницу стиля итальянского и французского, это барокко, было звучание на французском Bravo. I think that this is absolutely, before we reach the soul of a people, we first have to travel through its language. And I hope that you will be as amazed as I am when I, as I was when I found this out. Uh, to what extent a difference in language, uh, um, to what insights that can lead um, in order to understand the music better. И я думаю, вы будете также изумлены, как я был изумлен, когда я узнал, какие открытия позволяют сделать исследование разницы в языке, какие музыкальные открытия. Actually, it will prove, I will prove to you that all the differences that are still on the whiteboard are due to the difference in language. And the great thing is, is, is that I will send you home with questions because you will wonder, oh my God, I know we have Russian, we have German, we have English. What would, I mean, what would it be the consequence of studying these languages in relation to the music that is composed in these cultures. I hope that after this session about language, nothing will be at the same for you. I hope that after this session about language, nothing will be at the same for you. <laughs> but before we start, let's take a break, huh? Before we start. <laughs> Affect and the same theme as subject. So, I really have tried to have something very, very comparable. Я действительно постарался подобрать что-то очень сопоставимое. The theme is of, of fears. Uh, of тема Арфей. Mm? And the, 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 the text is, is a mourning or a, or a tender mourning text. Uh, текст представляет из себя плач, такую нежную жалобу. Mm? Um, uh, the most objective thing now would have been if we had a Frenchman and an Italian who could read it very emphatically 
with their in their own language. Uh, представлены итальянец и француз, которые могли бы каждый на своем языке прочитать этот текст выражением фазы. We have only one of both. We have a real Frenchman here. У нас есть только, к сожалению, только настоящий француз. I would, I will double then for the Italian, um, and I think having, having studied quite a time in Italy, I think I could cope with the job. Мне придется самому читать для итальянца, но поскольку я очень долго учился в Италии, то what I will ask you is again, as we did yesterday morning, to write down the differences as you observe it. Observe it. Most of you will not understand either of both texts, which is good because the only thing you can listen at is at the musicality of every language. И как вчера я попрошу вас записать те различия, которые вы услышите. Большинство из вас не поймет слов, но это как раз хорошо, потому что тогда вы будете слушать музыку. So we will go both going to act as actors before an audience who recites a text. We will do it with an alta voce, with a, with a, with a really not just speaking for us, but speaking for an audience. And, and we will also try to, in our declamation, try to um, um, transmit the affect of the text, the feeling of the text to the audience. Except for the things that I just said, I did not prepare him, I did not ask him to do anything, anything specific in one direction or another. It actually, he has question marks to as to what I expect from him. From my side, I will promise. I promise you that I will not um, uh, already put my version. Um, list of examples that we listened at yesterday morning again. But before we do that, I must modify or must correct or detail the picture that I have, or, or the image that I have pictured this morning a little bit. Но прежде чем мы приступим к этому, мне хотелось бы несколько изменить или уточнить ту картину, которая называется Although there is something in the French language that you could call this is typical of the French language, хотя во французском существует нечто, о чем можно сказать, что это типично для французского. The language itself uh, changed quite a lot since the 1780s. Сам язык очень сильно изменился с 17 века. And whereas Italian has remained pretty much the same since the 15th century, we have to come for regional dialects that were as important as uh, that, that for us are now as ex uh, as important the regional uh, differences then as the historical differences in France. Yeah. So I did not bring enough CDs to illustrate all the different dialects in Italy, um, ranging from High Tuscan as the main language to Neapolitan, Venetian, uh, uh, Ligurian, so Genovese, uh, Piemontese, Bolognese. I think, by the way, that um, for Baroque music, there are only two other dialects of Italian that you really have to account with um, uh, or to reckon with. And this is Neapolitan as an important region with its own musical culture and the Venetian dialect that is definitely, Venice is so separate <laughs> from Italy that even today you feel like you're another country. Uh, для порочного периода особенно важны 
неаполитанский диалект с очень развитой культурой неаполита в то время, и диалект венецианский. Венеция всегда была несколько сама по себе, и даже сегодня чувствуется, что попадая в Венецию, в Италию, чувствуется, что как, как будто в другую страну попадает. Um, also for my literature, for the literature I'm playing, um, I'm not so much um, confronted with Neapolitan um, dialect because um, the quarters were, were, were apparently never really played in, in, in Naples and well, there was just one little period, but it's not, Naples for me is not an important part in my um, practice. And Venice is, and this is what I'm doing for myself at this very moment. I'm trying to study Venetian dialect and to see the links between the typical Venetian dialect and uh, the compositions ranging from Riccio in the beginning of, or Gabrieli in the beginning of the 17th century until Vivaldi at the end of the 17th century. So I'm, I'm studying Venetian to understand the typical aspects of Venetian music going from Gabriele at the beginning of the 17th century to, to oh, even La Lupi in the middle of the 18th century. It's a research project and I've, I've, I've not finished yet, so I will not I can tell you not much at this very moment. It's, it's really a difficult uh, project. Also because um, Venetian music was not just representative for Venetian culture, it was meant as an export product. Важно и то, что венецианская культура создавалась не только для внутреннего потребления, она рассматривалась как продукт на экспорт. So you have to understand that when a, when a country or when a city produces something of its own, something typical for a city, that says a lot about, that, about the city, but as soon as it is wrapped in paper and sent uh, all over the world, it's going through a transformation and it's made acceptable for, for everybody. Следует помнить, что если город производит нечто для него характерное, не совсем то же, как этот товар сворачивается в магу и рассылается по всему миру, таким вот при этом трансформируется и делается приемлемым и доступным для потребления за пределами родного города. So I have not reached the point yet where I, where I could develop a system or a theory that would separate the, the indigenous elements that are pertinent or that pertain for, for the specificity of, a, of Venetian music and the things that were added to it were transformed into a sort of commercial rap. Uh, so I can, so I cannot give you an in-depth illustration of all that. The only thing I can do is to confront you with uh, different kinds of Italian that were, at specific moments in specific regions, as important and as as uh, present in the musical scene as what you could refer to as classical Italian or Tuscan Italian. And we'll start with a cantata composed by the very famous and respected composer Alessandro Scarlatti. <laughs> In, in lingua napolitana and um, with the following refined text
sasavši saski su sučiru saski. Da, ti zastavljaj ты заставляешь мою голову разрываться на части, я превратился в бубуина, влюбившись в Зезу. Это совершенно серьезно, не шутка, так есть. Which number is that? Is it number six? So again, we have two two uh, elements here. We have um, the the contents of the text, which is so low that it cannot be anything else than Italian in the 17th century. In France, this is totally impossible, unthinkable. But secondly, you will be astonished to hear his pronunciation. He's near part of the guy who sings. He's actually not trained as a singer, but as an actor. He's uh, still a classically trained commedia dell'arte actor. And as part of his training, he had also to sing. As part of his training, he had also to learn how to sing. И это входит в образование актера комедии для арта пения. So he is not trained in conservatory. Conservatory он не учился. But he sings with in his dialect, so with all the natural inclinations of the voice that go with his native language. Поет он на своем родном диалекте, поэтому голос, естественно, следует всем оборотам этого диалекта. He's probably one of the best recitative singers I ever heard. Это один из лучших певцов речитативов, которые я когда-либо слышал. But you will be astonished now after having had this introduction this morning about Italian, the placement of the vowels, and also how all this is so different in your politics. If I would have uh, let you hear that this morning, you would say that this was French, probably, or something. So the last one is not in 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 this. If this would exist in Italian, 
this would mean that this would say medosilio. So it becomes but in the important it becomes medosilio. So it's mm -hmm. really totally different as as, as high Italian. Um, uh, also, the tarantella that you heard yesterday, heard yesterday, was a Neapolitan. Still, you hear a voice that goes when it goes high. Oh no, no, that stays in breast, breast register. That works still basically with dynamics and not with lengthening, or not only with. Uh, it, it, he works with lengthening of consonants, but also still, as all Italian does, with dynamics. Maybe um, to have the same singer now sing Italian, just to hear the difference when he speaks high Italian. This is um, This is an, an, an cantata by Giuseppe Tricarico, who is also a Neapolitan composer, but the text is in Italian, not in Neapolitan. Cantata uh, Neapolitanskova compositor Giuseppe Tricarico, no cantata написан text na italianskom nie na The text goes. Um, презрение, дерзкий защитник воинственных мыслей, его знамя означает, что не будет более мира, не будет более передышки. Italian is not a unified country, in that there are regional dialects, and that uh, probably if you study um, um, Scarlatti as a whole, and if you study, I don't know, um, um, uh, who else should I say? Well, I think especially Scarlatti from, from Naples, or whether you study Galuppi from Venice, or you study um, Cavalieri from Tuscany that actually you deal with something basic Italian, but you also deal with regional differences. And the Cavalieri or Cavalieri or Giacomo Perti, Bologna. Um, so this is important in, 
Italian to take in your mind. In French, however, now we have to do something to let you hear something that will probably shock our Frenchmen here. This is um, an, an, a man, Eugene Green, um, who has American and French parents, he's, he's bilingual. And he studied classical French as it was pronounced and declaimed in the concept. Together with Shakespearean English, these are probably the only two languages, historical languages, that are incredibly documented that you can actually reconstruct them because they have we have treatises about the exact nature of the sounds. Classically, Francuski and Anglicky, примерно Шекспира, язык Шекспира, пожалуй, единственные два случая, которые очень хорошо документированы и можно по трактатам проследить, как-то описывается подробно, как в точности произносились звуки. So this is absolutely, please believe that. This is not the fantasy of just one guy who wants to do very, something special. This is, this is based on solid evidence and on really lots of documents. I will just um, let you hear a sonnet. Um, com uh, written because it's poetry, it's not a composition, it's, it's a declamation. It's a By Théophile de Vio. Uh, I think it must be around 1700. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for the date while you listen. And it's, um, um, it's um, a poem to Isis. Um, is is uh, described as 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 the goddess as a goddess that uh, makes the the heavens shine. Is, is yeah, is I think you should. Name, or is it a, uh, a, 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 I don't know. The, the goddesses. We could say it shortly. Mm -hmm. Sunrise also. Ah, the poem is written by a woman. It is about her. Красота, э, э, говорится, что э, боги занимаются исключительно тобой, 